Welcome everyone to our presentation on return to the workplace and COVID-19 accommodations. My name is Dustin Schwab and I am a career development specialist here at Opportunities for Ohioans with Disabilities, which we refer to as OOD. Today I am co-hosting with my colleague Julie Wood. Julie, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you Dustin and hello to everyone who's joining us today. My name is Julie Wood and I am the Worksite Accessibility Specialist here at OOD. I am also an Occupational Therapist and an ADA Coordinator. One of the roles I have is to create and deliver presentations that are geared toward our employer partners. And so today's webinar is focused on the return to the workplace phase of the COVID-19 pandemic and what is unique about reasonable accommodations during this time. Thank you, Julie. Before we, be, before we begin, I'd like to mention that today's training comes with the PowerPoint slides, a learner's guide and helpful fact sheet. You can access these resources through the link that is posted in the Q&A section here in Microsoft Teams. Just as a reminder, the information that we share in these resources and during today's conversation is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice. But we do hope this information is helpful for you. We will be stopping about halfway through today's presentation and then once more right before we conclude to answer questions. So please post your questions in the Q&A section at any time so they're ready for us when we stop. Okay, so today we are focused on providing reasonable accommodations when employers are returning employees to the workplace. Now, we know many employees never left the workplace and some employers brought employees back at different points during the pandemic based on their unique situations. Julie, what will you be sharing today with our employers who are now in this phase of bringing employees back to work? Dustin, we are going to start with sharing the pandemic related guidance that is available to support employers in making their decisions and following their responsibilities under Title I of the Americans with Disabilities Act, which is referred to as the ADA. Then we are going to discuss a few key areas of the interactive process that employers have had questions about related to COVID-19 and we will talk about how to address a direct threat to health. But most of the webinar is focused on the reasonable accommodation requests employers are receiving unique to where we are in the pandemic and returning to the workplace. That sounds very timely. Let's start with sharing the guidance that is available. Okay, so I know that employers are still required to follow Title I of the ADA during the COVID-19 pandemic. But Julie, as we know, guidance from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission or the EEOC and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention or CDC related to the pandemic has been evolving over time. How does an employer know which guidance to follow? What takes precedence? Dustin, you are correct. Employers continue to have responsibilities under Title I during a pandemic. However, Title I does not interfere with employers following the guidance and suggestions that come from the CDC and state and local public health authorities. And these entities have been updating their guidance as the pandemic evolves, so it's a good idea to review the guidance often to remain current. Julie, where can employers find this information? Dustin, we included some of the commonly referenced resources in the beginning of the Learner's Guide along with their websites. For example, the EEOC has a website called Coronavirus and COVID-19, and it includes two very helpful resources. The first is the Pandemic Preparedness in the Workplace and the Americans with Disabilities Act, and the second is called What You Should Know About COVID-19 and the ADA, the Rehabilitation Act, and other EEO laws. If you also want to keep up with health and safety guidelines, the CDC has a website called COVID-19, and the Ohio Department of Health has a website called Coronavirus COVID-19. For employers with questions about guidelines for the work environment, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, or OSHA, has a website called Protecting Workers, guidance on mitigating and preventing the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. 
And one final resource I'll share is on the Job Accommodation Network or JAN website, and it's called Coronavirus Disease 2019. These resources address common questions employers have when following both Title I of the ADA and adhering to health and safety guidelines during the pandemic for all aspects of the hiring process and during employment, including returning employees to the workplace. So the take home message is to keep an eye on the guidance so that you stay up to date. OK, so now we are going to discuss some trends related to the pandemic occurring during the interactive process, which is the process employers engage in when they receive a request for a reasonable accommodation. Julie, how should employers handle a request from an employee who did not have a reasonable accommodation before the pandemic, but requests one now upon returning to the workplace? Dustin, employers should handle this request the same way they handle any request for a reasonable accommodation, and that is to begin the interactive process. Remember, individuals with disabilities can request a reasonable accommodation at any point during the hiring process and employment. And as a quick reminder, a reasonable accommodation is a change in the hiring process or the workplace that removes a barrier and enables an individual with a disability to participate in hiring or work-related activities. Employers are required under Title I to provide reasonable accommodations when they're needed, unless doing so causes an undue hardship. Now, the reason an employee who did not need an accommodation before the pandemic, but requests one upon returning to the office, may be because something changed. Employers may also receive requests from employees who did have reasonable accommodations previously, but because something changed, now they need a different accommodation or an additional one. Julie, what do you mean by a change? Dustin, I am referring to a change in the disability or a change at work. During the pandemic, it's possible that individuals experienced an onset of a disability or an exacerbation of a current disability. And we have seen the workplace change. Many employees were sent home to work and that may have caused a need for an accommodation at that time because the work environment was different. Now that employees are returning to the workplace, the workplace may not be the same as before the pandemic and this may cause an employee with a disability to need an accommodation. So no matter the reason for the request, the employer handles all requests the same and begins the interactive process. We have heard some employers are receiving requests for various reasons like pregnancy, uh, being a caregiver for a person with a medical condition or due to age. Julie, is there any difference in the way employers respond to these requests? Uh, there is a difference. Our focus is on Title I of the ADA and for the ADA to apply, the individual who is requesting the accommodation must be doing so based on their own disability related need. So this means the accommodation must be for the person, not for someone else, and it must be tied to a disability. Based on the three examples you gave, the employer would first need to identify who the accommodation is for and why it's needed and then determine whether the ADA or another federal law applies. For the individual who is asking for an accommodation because they are a caregiver to someone with a medical condition, Title I does not apply. In the other two examples, the individual is asking for an accommodation for themselves based on age or pregnancy. So in these cases, the employer is permitted to verify a disability exists and identify the need for the reasonable accommodation. To qualify for protection under Title I for a reasonable accommodation, an individual must have a disability that meets the ADA's definition, which means a condition results in a physical or mental impairment that causes a substantial limitation with a major life activity. The ADA does not have a list of conditions that automatically qualify a person as having a disability, and so age and pregnancy alone do not automatically qualify as disabilities. So then it's important for employers to know when Title I applies, uh, 
and to remember that they are permitted to verify a disability. Now, I recently saw a news story on the long-term effects of COVID-19. It seems that there are a range of symptoms that people might experience after they have had COVID-19. If someone has some of these long-term symptoms, is that considered a disability? Dustin, this is a common question. Just like with age and pregnancy, the ADA does not have a list of conditions that automatically qualify as a disability. And so having COVID-19 or the long-term effects related to having COVID-19 may or may not qualify an individual as having a disability. The Department of Justice and the Department of Health and Human Services did issue a joint guidance which indicates that the long-term effects of COVID-19 can be a disability under the ADA. So to make this determination, the employer would follow the same guidance from the EEOC to determine whether the individual's impairment rises to the level of a disability, just as the employer would do with any request they receive for an accommodation. And remember, when the disability or the need for the accommodation is not obvious, the employer is permitted to request medical documentation from an appropriate treating source. Sounds like the bottom line is that, that the guidance is the same for verifying a disability exists no matter what the condition is, which means employers should continue to follow the interactive process when they receive a request for a reasonable accommodation. Julie, can you remind us of the steps for the reasonable for the interactive process? Sure. So when an employer receives a request, they are expected to act quickly and begin the interactive process to identify the need for the accommodation and an effective solution. Now, navigating the interactive process during a pandemic is generally the same as when there is no pandemic, and the steps include recognizing a request for an accommodation, obtaining the necessary information, and then identifying, implementing, and monitoring the reasonable accommodation. Great, thank you for that quick summary of the interactive process. For employers who would like more detailed information on the interactive process, we have an on-demand webinar on the employer's page of the OOD website called Navigating the Reasonable Accommodation Process. And we've included the link in the learner's guide. Now let's talk about health and safety. At the beginning of the pandemic, employers had to make many decisions to try to keep their employees safe. Even as we have made significant progress to keep one another safe, I think there are probably still concerns of whether certain situations pose a direct threat to health. Julie, can you remind us of the ADA guidelines for direct threat? Sure, so Title I does permit employers to create qualification standards that require individuals to not pose a direct threat to health or safety. And according to the ADA, a direct threat is a significant risk of substantial harm to the health or safety of the individual or others that cannot be eliminated or reduced by reasonable accommodation. There are two important aspects of direct threat to keep in mind. The first is the standard must apply to all individuals in the same job class. And the second is making the determination of direct threat requires an individualized assessment and the EEOC has provided criteria for this assessment in their guidance. One key part of the assessment is the requirement to consider whether a reasonable accommodation is available to eliminate the direct threat or reduce it to an acceptable level. So then it seems that contracting COVID-19 could pose a direct threat to the health of an individual. Do employers need to be proactive to accommodate employees that they know are at risk of severe illness if they contract COVID-19? Now, they are not required under the ADA to be proactive if the employee has not requested a reasonable accommodation. The EEOC says an employer is not permitted to take an adverse action against the individual that is solely based on the individual having one of the conditions the CDC has identified as potentially putting the individual at a higher risk if they contract COVID. How does the employer determine if an employee does pose a direct threat to the health and safety of the employee or to others in the workplace? 
if an employer knows an employee has one of the conditions on the CDC's list and they are concerned about a direct threat to the employee's health, they can't assume a direct threat exists solely based on the employee having this condition. The employer would need to conduct the individualized assessment we mentioned using the EEOC's criteria, which says determining direct threat must be based on a reasonable medical judgment about the condition and use the most current medical information and the best objective information available. And so during the assessment, the employer is required to consider factors like the duration of the risk, the nature and severity of the potential harm, the likelihood the harm will occur, and the imminence of the potential harm. Some additional factors the EEOC has included in its pandemic guidance are how severe the pandemic is in the employer's area, the likelihood the employee would be exposed to the virus at work, and the measures the employer has implemented to protect all workers from exposure. What's most important for employers to remember any time they are concerned about direct threat is they must follow the EEOC's criteria to make this determination. So based on what we have discussed, the employer should complete the individualized assessment if they think an employee might be at a serious risk if the employee contracts COVID-19. When this assessment results in a determination of direct threat to the employee's health if they contract COVID-19, what can an employer do to reduce or eliminate that threat? Dustin, this is an important part of direct threat to be aware of. And that is the requirement to consider whether there is a reasonable accommodation that can do what you just suggested, which is to reduce or eliminate the threat. Now, some of these ideas might be strategies the employer already has in place for all employees, like wearing personal protective equipment, such as face coverings and gloves, or making sure there is physical distance between employees by placing barriers in the workplace, like plexiglass dividers, or increasing space between employees' workstations. Beyond that, determining an effective reasonable accommodation always requires the employer and the employee to engage in the interactive process to work together to identify a solution. And the solution is always unique to the employee, the work environment, and the employer, but some examples of reasonable accommodations in this situation of direct threat may include changes like restructuring a job to eliminate or trade the less critical tasks of the job, which are known as the marginal functions, or to permit a flexible schedule so the employee is working at a time where fewer employees are in the work environment, or to relocate the workstation away from a high traffic area or a large group of coworkers to increase distance between others. And what if, for some reason, none of those or other accommodations are sufficient? Are there any other options? Justin, in this case, the employer would consider other types of reasonable accommodations, such as leave, telework, and reassignment. And we are going to discuss reasonable accommodations in more detail. But before we do, let's take our first break to see what questions have come in. So, uh, Julie, the first question I have uh, is what if an employee was already receiving a reasonable accommodation before the pandemic and now requests another accommodation or a different one? Right, so this can occur for the reasons we mentioned. Um, there's changes in the workplace or um, somebody could have an onset of a disability or something about their disability changed um, during the pandemic. And so this um, is just the reminder that an employee can request a reasonable accommodation at any point during employment um, and because of a change that might be why you see some new requests coming in now. Awesome and for the direct threat assessment does the employee need to request the accommodation or do the employers need to be proactive if they know that the employee has one of the medical conditions that was listed? So this could happen either way certainly if an employee is aware that they have a condition um, and they would like to ask for a reasonable accommodation, um, they can do that. And so you begin the interactive process. So you might find out about this concern that way. Um, 
you may know that the employee has a condition on the CDC list, either because they have already disclosed that to you. Maybe they've asked for a, a reasonable accommodation in the past, or sometimes um, disabilities and conditions are obvious to us, and so we just already know. Um, so if that's the case and you, you have a reason to believe that a person might pose a direct threat to their own health, then you would go ahead and be proactive at that point um, and follow the, the EEOC criteria for that assessment so that it can kind of happen in either way. Great, thank you. That looks like all the questions that we have right now. Um, as a reminder, we will be stopping again before the end of the presentation to answer some more questions. So feel free to type those in the chat as we go along. Um, but thank you all for those questions. Now, now we're going to go ahead and talk about reasonable accommodations specific to returning to the workplace, which five common areas where employers have questions about at this point during the pandemic are the long term effects of COVID, high risk medical conditions, mental health disabilities, telework, and then hybrid workplaces. So Julie, as I mentioned earlier, I saw a news story on some of the long term effects that people have reported after recovering from COVID-19. Uh, they included brain fog, extreme fatigue, shortness of breath, headaches, insomnia, uh, joint pain and body aches, and tachycardia, which is a rapid heart rate. Are there any unique reasonable accommodations for these symptoms? Well, the solution is always unique to the employee, the job, the work environment, and the employer. But there are ideas for reasonable accommodations for each of these long term effects, and they fall into the same types of accommodation solutions we have for all disabilities. I'll share a couple examples from Jan for each long term effect, and then we have included additional ideas in the learner's guide. Great. Let's start with brain fog. What is meant by brain fog and what are some ideas for reasonable accommodations? Dustin, brain fog is a term that describes a collection of symptoms which impact the ability to think, like confusion, difficulty concentrating, disorganized thinking, and difficulty putting ideas into words. A few ideas for accommodations that could be considered include providing a work area that is free of visual or noise distractions, permitting the employee to use memory aids like a flowchart or a checklist, and allowing the employee to work uninterrupted for a period of time. Awesome. How can extreme fatigue and insomnia be accommodated? Dustin, extreme fatigue can impact an individual's ability to perform their daily activities, and one very important daily activity is work. Insomnia is a disruption in sleep, whether it's falling to sleep, staying asleep, or waking up early. The accommodations can be similar, so I have grouped these two long-term effects together. The types of reasonable accommodations that could be effective include permitting a modified break schedule, which permits the employee to take breaks as needed from the physical or mental exertion of the job. Another example is to provide a flexible schedule, which allows the person to work the hours when their energy is most optimal for work tasks. One last idea is to consider modifying a no food or drink at the workstation policy so an employee can keep a cold drink at the workstation. Julie, how would an employer accommodate an employee experiencing headaches? Well, there are varying types of headaches with a range of symptoms. Some ideas you can consider include removing any triggers in the workplace, like light, you may need to reduce glare or eliminate overhead lighting and supplement with specific types of lighting through desk lamps or natural light. If triggers at work cannot be eliminated, then another option could be to permit the employee to telework if the essential functions of the job can be performed remotely. Great. So joint pain and body aches, they can also be a long term effect. Yes, and just like the other effects, these symptoms will be unique to the individual. For this, we could consider an accommodation we've already mentioned, like a modified break schedule to permit the employee to take a rest break from physical activity or sustained sitting. And some accommodations we haven't talked about include providing an ergonomic assessment of the workstation to minimize symptoms and improve the employee's comfort during work. 
and an employer could consider removing or swapping marginal functions that may exacerbate the pain. Those are great ideas. Shortness of breath can also be a long-term effect. Are these accommodations like the ones we mentioned for aches and pains? Dustin, certainly some of them can be, like permitting rest breaks and removing or swapping marginal functions. A few unique ideas may include making considerations for face coverings. For example, consider permitting the employee to remove the face covering when it's appropriate, or consider providing an alternative mask if that's possible. You could also look for ways to remove any triggers in the work environment and to reduce physical exertion through an ergonomic assessment. I think an important consideration is to make sure to create a plan of action to handle any sudden bouts of shortness of breath that occur to assure the safety of the employee. Oh, that's a good point about addressing safety. Our last long-term effect we mentioned is tachycardia, which is our fast heart rate that can be caused by a variety of disorders. Are there any accommodations in addition to the ones we've already discussed that might be helpful for this long-term effect? Dustin, yes, many of the accommodations we mentioned could be effective for tachycardia as well, like permitting rest breaks, permitting drinks at the workstation, and providing an ergonomic assessment. Some additional ideas include controlling the temperature of the workstation or to permit leave so the employee can get treatment for this condition if that is what is needed. Just like with shortness of breath, it's important to create a plan of action to handle a sudden onset of tachycardia for the safety of the employee. Thank you for sharing these ideas, Julie. As you mentioned, we have included even more along with the JAN resource in the learner's guide. Let's talk now about accommodations for employees with high-risk medical conditions. As we mentioned, the CDC has a list of conditions which place individuals at a potentially greater risk of severe Ill illness if they contract COVID-19. We discussed some things an employer can do if they determine the employee poses a direct threat to their own health. What are some additional ideas for employers to consider when employees request reasonable accommodations based on their increased risk? Dustin, thank you for bringing this up because I did want to emphasize that considering reasonable accommodations for employees who are at a higher risk can come about in two ways. So the first way we already discussed, which is if the employer knows about the employee's condition and through an individualized assessment determines a direct threat exists, and next considers the options to reduce or eliminate the risk through a reasonable accommodation. The other way is when the employee with one of these conditions requests a reasonable accommodation. I do have some additional ideas that we didn't discuss earlier, but could apply to either situation. In high traffic areas, an employer could designate one-way travel through aisles or hallways. Another idea may be to permit a temporary transfer to another position until the direct threat no longer exists. Thank you for pointing out the two situations that could occur for employers to consider accommodations for employees who have conditions that put them at a higher risk. Now, as the pandemic has progressed, I know there was a lot of emphasis placed on mental health. Some people who were previously diagnosed with mental health disabilities experienced symptoms to a greater degree. I believe there was also an increase in the diagnoses of anxiety and depression among people worried about contracting COVID-19 or contracting it again after already having after already having it. Some people are experiencing these symptoms may not have needed accommodations before the pandemic or while teleworking. What is the best way for employers to handle new requests related to mental health disabilities? Great question, Dustin. As we say in many of our webinars, often employees with disabilities do not need accommodations to perform their jobs. However, this can change whenever there is a change in the employee's disability or in the workplace. And remember, employees with disabilities can request reasonable accommodations at any point during employment. So as you said, during the pandemic, an individual may have developed a mental health disability or experienced an exacerbation of an existing condition. Either of these situations could cause an employee who did not need an accommodation before to need one now. In either case, when the employer receives the request, 
They should begin the interactive process as they would any time they receive a request for a reasonable accommodation. And we know part of this process is to verify the disability exists and verify the need for the accommodation. When either of these or both are not obvious, the employer is permitted to request medical documentation. What kinds of reasonable accommodations might be implemented for employees with mental health disabilities who are returning to the workplace? Well, what each person needs will be unique, but I do have some general examples employers can consider. You've heard this one before for a variety of disabilities and it's permitting a flexible schedule. In this case, the flexible schedule may permit the employee to attend regular medical appointments necessary for treatment of the condition. Because mental illness can impact a person's ability to think, one kind of accommodation is to provide a template for an employee to use when creating a report for work or permit the employee to use a flow chart to assist with completing work tasks in the proper order. Another idea is to use reminder applications on a smart device to remember things like taking a break or returning from lunch on time or to complete one task and shift to another. One final idea might be to minimize distractions to increase concentration for work, which can be accomplished by installing partitions between workstations in high traffic areas. Great ideas. I am seeing the types of reasonable accommodations repeated, but used in a different way. I think that helps all of us to better understand the many options there are for reasonable accommodations. Now we are going to shift our focus to a type of reasonable accommodation which has become a hot topic, and that is telework. Julie, many employees have been working remotely throughout the pandemic. Now, some employers are bringing employees back to the workplace, either full time or creating a hybrid environment. Other employers have decided to make telework permanent. Certainly, the pandemic has led to new questions and concerns about telework as a type of reasonable accommodation. What guidance is available to employers? Dustin, discussing the guidance is a great way to introduce the topic of telework because it has always been a type of reasonable accommodation. But because of the pandemic, you are right, it has led to many questions. Our discussion on telework, including the content in the learner's guide, comes from the published guidance from the EEOC before the pandemic and during the pandemic, as well as some guidance shared by Jan that is informal at this point. As I mentioned, telework has always been a type of reasonable accommodation that an employer could consider amongst other types of reasonable accommodations while they are determining the effective solution. However, the telework that many employees were required to perform during the pandemic has certainly informed what we know about performing jobs remotely. So between that and the concerns that come with returning to the workplace, we do have many questions surfacing. So we are going to talk about some of these questions and refer to the guidance from the EEOC to inform employers so employers feel more comfortable in making their decisions about telework, hybrid environments, and reasonable accommodations. Because we won't be addressing every component of telework, we do encourage employers to review the EEOC guidance, and we've included the links to this information in the learner's guide. So I know that many employers have had employees teleworking throughout the pandemic. For many of the, the symptoms we listed, for many of the symptoms we listed, telework is also a potential reasonable accommodation. How might employers utilize telework as a reasonable accommodation in the future? Well, Dustin, the pre-pandemic guidance states that employers are not required to establish telework policies under Title I, but if they have one, employees with disabilities must be provided an equal opportunity to participate in telework. This may include modifying the policy as a form of reasonable accommodation so the employee can participate. The example the guidance provides is that if the policy requires an employee to have worked for the employer for a year before being permitted to telework, this requirement may need to be waived for an employee who needs to telework as a form of reasonable accommodation.
The guidance also states that employers are not required to have an estab established telework policy to permit this as a form of reasonable accommodation. Now, many employers are choosing to continue with telework in some fashion, whether it's permanent or through a hybrid environment, and so many employers are creating telework policies. So policy or no policy, telework is a type of reasonable accommodation that employers could always consider, and certainly using telework during the pandemic informed employers of how effective telework is for performing work. Knowing this information will help employers to better assess whether telework is an effective solution when it is requested as a reasonable accommodation. So if an employee has been working remotely throughout the pandemic and then requests to continue telework as a reasonable accommodation, can the employer explore other reasonable accommodation options? Dustin, the employer is not required to automatically grant this request simply because employees were teleworking during the pandemic. When an employer receives a request for a reasonable accommodation of any type, they begin the interactive process right away. Part of this process is to work collaboratively with the employee to identify the need for the accommodation and how the accommodation will enable the employee to perform the job effectively. During this time, the employer can explore options to determine which ones are reasonable and effective. The guidance from the EEOC encourages employers to consider the preference of the employee, but ultimately gives the employer the right to choose the effective solution. We have to remember each employee, disability, job, and employer are unique. Whether telework is the best effective solution for each request is always going to be a case-by-case -case determination. The employer may select another form of reasonable accommodation that is effective in enabling the employee to perform the job in the workplace instead of permitting continued telework. You know, so many reasonable accommodations are implemented in the workplace. Using telework as a reasonable accommodation is kind of like setting up an alternative workplace. Does the process of assessing telework as a reasonable accommodation or the interactive process differ from other accommodations? The interactive process is always the same because it's just a series of steps you take to verify the disability, identify the need for the accommodation, explore options, select an effective solution, and then implement and monitor the reasonable accommodation. Now, specific to a request for telework as a reasonable accommodation, the employer is permitted to ask questions to identify why the employee needs to work from home, why performing the essential functions is difficult in the workplace, and how the essential functions can be performed effectively at home. How you assess whether any reasonable accommodation is effective is unique to each type of accommodation and, of course, unique to each employee, employer, and job. So even before the pandemic, I was aware of employers that allowed employees to telework on an occasional basis. Employees who utilized telework as a reasonable accommodation don't necessarily need to telework for their full work weeks. Some employees with disabilities might benefit from teleworking half days or certain days throughout the week. What are some things for employers to keep in mind when determining how frequently an employee teleworks? Can certain tasks be de designated for certain locations? That's right, Dustin. Using telework as a form of reasonable accommodation doesn't have to be an all or nothing option. It can be flexible and customized based on what the employee needs and what the employer determines is effective. Figuring this out often begins with determining what essential functions can be performed at home and whether some can only be performed at the workplace. So the EEOC does provide guidance for employers to consider when they are making this determination. And these are factors like supervision, necessary equipment or tools, in-person interactions with coworkers or customers, coordination of work with coworkers, and immediate access to documents or information only located in the workplace. Of course, when an employer is considering these factors, they also want to think about the various types of reasonable accommodations that could enable the employee to perform an essential function effectively in another way 
in the telework environment. For example, an employer may consider whether the outcome of in-person interactions with coworkers can be performed just as effectively through a video call, phone call, chat message, or email. Now, once an employer figures out what can be performed remotely and what can't be, then the employer and employee should decide whether working part-time in the workplace and part-time at home is effective in meeting the needs of both parties. For example, a job may require an employee to meet in person with a client, but tasks like writing reports can be performed effectively through telework. I think there are employers who altered their expectations of employees during the pandemic. They may have excused or modified an employee's essential functions based on what was possible while teleworking. For example, uh, employees who work in office jobs may have had cleaning responsibilities that were not necessary while teleworking since nobody was in the office. Can employers restore all essential functions when they have employees return to the workplace? You are right. Some employers chose to excuse certain essential functions during the pandemic when employees were sent home to work. Now, some of these employers are returning employees to the workplace where all essential functions can be performed. So a request to telework as a form of reasonable accommodation does not have to be granted if doing so means an employer would have to continue to excuse the employee from performing an essential function. This is because the EEOC does not require employers to remove an essential function as a form of reasonable accommodation. What the pandemic guidance from the EEOC says is when employers temporarily excused some essential functions when requiring or permitting telework due to COVID-19, it did not mean the employer permanently changed a job's essential functions. It did not mean telework is always a feasible accommodation, and it does not mean that telework does not pose an undue hardship. So it's important to be aware that the ADA does not prevent employers from restoring the job's essential functions when employees return to the previous workplace. Again, making this determination happens during the interactive process where the employer and the employee collaborate to determine what is needed and consideration is given to how essential functions can be performed effectively and a variety of types of reasonable accommodations can be considered when making this decision. Okay, so I think many employers and employees have learned the value of telework throughout the pandemic. Organizations that had never considered telework as an option before the pandemic learned that it was possible and in many cases productive. Should employers who have had employees teleworking handle future requests for telework any differently? That's right. This period of teleworking during the pandemic really served as a trial for telework and it demonstrated whether essential functions could be performed effectively in this environment. So as employers are returning employees to the workplace, if they receive requests for telework as a reasonable accommodation, they now have more information to use when they're evaluating whether the employee can perform the job's essential functions effectively in a remote office. Regardless of that answer, the request for telework as a reasonable accommodation should be handled through the same interactive process the employer engages in with any employee who requests a reasonable accommodation. Thanks, Julie. As you mentioned earlier, some employers might choose to implement a hybrid work environment in which all employees work from the office some days and remotely other days. I'm thinking there are probably employees who had physical accommodations established in one work location. Now that these employees essentially have two work locations, how should employers handle this? Dustin, employers are receiving a variety of reasonable accommodation requests for the hybrid working environment. These include requests for a private office, a flexible schedule, equipment in both locations, and to telework full time. And these requests may be based on an existing condition, but due to a change in the work environment, or these requests may be based on a new condition that developed during the pandemic. And so an employer should handle these requests according to the same criteria from the EEOC guidance and begin the interactive process promptly 
verify the disability exists and the need for the accommodation, and then work collaboratively with the employee to identify an effective solution. What does the EEOC guidance say about providing accommodations in both places? Dustin, I reached out to Jan with this question and they shared with me the informal guidance they were provided from the EEOC when they asked a similar question. I want to emphasize that the information I am going to share is not published guidance, and so I do not have a reference I can cite, such as a website, but I think the informal guidance is important to discuss with employers. So what Jan received back from the EEOC stated that under Title I, if the employer is permitting employees to work partly in the office and partly at home, the employer should consider providing accommodations in both locations when they are needed, unless to do so would cause an undue hardship. Now, doing so doesn't mean the exact same accommodation has to be provided in both locations. For example, if an employee has a hydraulic sit to stand station in the workplace, and needs a sit to stand station in the home environment, the employer could consider a less expensive option, such as a tabletop version, as long as it's effective. Or if the employee has a sit to stand station at home and requests one for the office, consider offering a sit to stand workstation at the office that can be shared by employees when it's their turn to work in the office. Can the employer consider the option of having the employee work in just one location instead? The informal guidance from the EEOC says employers should be cautious about refusing to permit an employee with a disability to enjoy the hybrid model to avoid providing reasonable accommodations in both locations. The EEOC said that during the interactive process, the employer can explore the possibility of the employee working in only one place, but should remain neutral and not force the employee to work full-time in one location to avoid potentially providing reasonable accommodations in both places. We also want to remember that making these decisions is unique for each employer. There are some jobs, as we discussed before, where some essential functions can only be performed on site. And so while a hybrid model may be utilized, it's possible that working entirely remotely is not possible when some essential functions cannot be performed. There's a lot for employers to consider, and these are unprecedented times. What I think is best for employers to remember is to follow the criteria we've always had under Title I for navigating the interactive process. Julie, you used a word I don't hear you refer to often. You said that EEOC stated to be cautious about refusing to permit an employee to enjoy the hybrid model. So often when we are discussing work and reasonable accommodations, we are discussing performing the job's essential functions. We don't talk about enjoying the job. What do you mean by enjoy? Dustin, there are three categories where employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities under Title I. Two of these categories we talk about frequently. We talk about how employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations for applicants with disabilities to access the entire hiring process and have equal access to compete for jobs. And we focus on employers' responsibility to provide reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities to perform the job's essential functions. But there's a third category that is required, but it just doesn't come up often. And that is employers are required to provide reasonable accommodations for employees with disabilities to enjoy the benefits and privileges of employment. For example, if you provide all employees parking Parking is a privilege and benefit of employment. And so if this parking is not accessible for an employee with a disability, they are permitted to request a reasonable accommodation and the employer is required to consider this request and start the interactive process to identify an effective solution. So now we have this hybrid working environment where on the one hand, yes, employers have to evaluate whether the job's essential functions can be performed, and when necessary, consider reasonable accommodations related to performing the job remotely. 
But if the hybrid working environment is not required, but it's a benefit and privilege of employment, employers still need to consider this category of responsibility for providing reasonable accommodations so employees with disabilities can enjoy this benefit and privilege of employment as all employees do, which is why the informal EEOC guidance cautions employers about refusing to permit an employee with a disability to enjoy the hybrid working model. So considering reasonable accommodations for the hybrid environment can be twofold for employers according to their responsibility under Title I. Do you have any examples of accommodations that could be utilized for people with concerns about contracting COVID-19 upon return to a communal workplace? I do. There are a variety of concerns and needs that employees and employees with disabilities have in returning to the workplace. In general, it's a good idea for employers to communicate what protocols they are implementing to keep the work environment safe for all employees. For example, any protocols regarding face coverings, physical distancing, and cleaning should be communicated to all employees. And with that communication, I would suggest including your reasonable accommodation statement so all employees know if they have a disability and need an accommodation, they can contact you to request one. Regarding employees with disabilities, what is needed is always determined on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on what the employee's impairment is and what the barrier at work is. For example, an employee with a disability who is immunocompromised may request to have a private office or an office that is in a low traffic area and physically distanced from coworkers, or an employee with an anxiety disorder who experiences symptoms when they are in an office with several other coworkers may request a flexible schedule to work during hours where fewer coworkers are in the office. And certainly some employees with disabilities are requesting to telework permanently. And as we've discussed already, the employer must consider the need for the accommodation, the job's essential functions, the effective options, and what is reasonable. So as I always say, it truly is a case-by-case -case analysis. Very true, Julie. Okay, let's take one more break to see what questions that we have. So Julie, do companies have a separate accommodation process for accommodation requests associated to the COVID pandemic, or are all accommodation requests funneled in the same process? According to the EEOC guidance, it's all the same interactive process. The pandemic um, might just be highlighting different parts of that process or, or bringing forth some new trends in the reasonable accommodation request that you receive, but relying on the same interactive process of recognizing the request and then kind of moving through the different steps that we discussed. Awesome. Um, how do you address accommodation requests when there are multiple conditions? However, then the employee only submits documentation from a general practitioner. So in that case, um, and I'm, I'm talking from a general perspective here because I don't know exactly what all of these different conditions are. Um, if the reasonable accommodation request is actually tied to each of these individual conditions and either those conditions or the need for the accommodation are not obvious, you can request um, medical documentation from an appropriate treating source. And so if the general practitioner is not the appropriate treating source, you can request that it come um, from one who is appropriate. Um, if any of these conditions are obvious, then of course we kind of bypass. We, we're, not, we're not allowed to then get that medical documentation, but I would kind of tease it out to find out if each of these conditions really is impacting this. And if so, yes, you can ask for the appropriate documentation. Okay, awesome. That looks like that might be all of our questions. Thank you all for your great questions. Um, Julie, do you have any final thoughts before we conclude? Yes, thank you, Dustin. I would like to close with the acknowledgement that we are all in an unprecedented time where Title I still applies, but our work environments have changed. And our request for reasonable accommodations reflect the times we are all in together. So the effective solutions may not be as apparent to us as they were before the pandemic. I would encourage everyone to rely on the interactive process as we always have, be patient and have some grace in working through this collaboration together with your employees 
and be flexible and creative in figuring out these new solutions. Remember, we are here to consult with our employer partners, and so if we can be of assistance, please contact us. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your interest in today's webinar. And Dustin, thank you. It's always great to present together.